so my name is Jiří Nádborník and I'm going to present you how we are actually using uh, the HDFI for our uh, semi-sparse cubes uh, for astronomical data actually. So I'm from uh, Czech Technical University in Prague. I'm actually an informatician and uh, basically I'm working for the astronomers uh, to enable them, you know, make the big discoveries of new kinds of objects in the universe. And uh, we decided to use the HDFI for that. By the way, uh, I had a question here, uh, like what's this big obelisk in front of our faculty? Uh, I need to disappoint you, it's just like overly artistic uh, ventilation from the garages, yeah, so uh, yeah, really efficient usage of the concrete there. Anyway, so uh, today I'm going to be speaking about our 4D data. We are basically combining spectra and images coming from spectrographs and uh, CCD cameras. So, and we are doing uh, machine learning on those. Yeah, this is, that is the ultimate goal, but we need to also do some visualization on the line, which is basically uh, introducing some additional challenges uh, that we have. Uh, I will today focus really on the semi-sparsity of the data that is uh, uh, the main goal yeah, the, um, or uh, the main challenge that we are having here. So uh, that's uh, uh, what I have time for here anyways. And then uh, basically um, uh, what I uh, will also focus on is uh, the lessons learned that we had so far uh, with H5Pi and HDF5 uh, SSE library um, uh, up until now. Yeah. So the current stage is that we are testing the parallel I.O. on some medium sized data sets like tens of terabytes of data. So I will get, the, get to that in a moment. So how does our data look like? Basically, uh, this is half of it. These are the images uh, on uh, this axis. Uh, there, there you can see on the vertical one, there is declination, right ascension here, and then there is wavelength on uh, the horizontal axis. So basically what you see here is like images in different colors, like purple one, blue one, etc. And if I combine that together with a spectrum, uh, which is just, you know, for one pixel in the middle of that image, uh, then you can see that the data is pretty sparse, right? But not, not all too sparse because we have the dense regions in there, uh, which are those images. So that's why it is actually semi-sparse data and why we actually decided to use HD5 in the end for it. And uh, uh, if uh, I take these 3D cubes, let's say, of uh, like images and spectra, uh, and I measure like uh, them for uh, one galaxy, for example, multiple times, then I get the fourth dimension, which is time. So this is like time series cube for me. This is how it looks like actually in uh, uh, virtual observatory tools. I'm not sure whether we have any astronomers here. Do we have any? Please raise your, raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. One. Uh, anyways, so, so this is a TopCat tool which they like to use. Uh, that's basically um, uh, like interoperability tool for displaying tables uh, and visualizing them. So in here you uh, can see measured flux densities. We are converting the spectra and images to those, so, so they are directly comparable, and uh, the machine learning is actually has much easier work uh, with them uh, afterwards. So here you can see images of two galaxies actually close to each other. That this is the one, this is the second one. Again, the same axis as for the previous. It's declination, right ascension, which is just x and y coordinates on the sky. And uh, uh, then uh, you have like five images of the same galaxy in different filters, in different colors. And uh, uh, then in the middle of the galaxy, there is a spectrum, the measured one, yeah? And then there is the second galaxy. And the ultimate goal why we are actually doing this is the machine learning ask, uh, asks a simple question. Is this galaxy actually similar to another one? And I can give a much more uh, reliable answer if I'm not just doing uh, the machine learning on uh, separately images and then spe separately spectra, but I, I can do it actually on the combination of those because I have more information to decide. So uh, what is the His cube doing? Actually, the hierarchical semi-sparse cube, as, as we are calling it. It's essentially a framework around HDFI, which is built like on top of H5Pi, uh, which is taking the uh, Sloan, uh, for example, images, the FITS files. Then it's taking uh, the spectra, combining them together within some kind of preprocessing here, and then writing it into the HDFI file, uh, this uh, red box in the middle. Then we are using some fancy indexing on the HDFI file to actually enable two kinds of access to the data. One is the, for the visualization purposes, which I, which I just showed you, is this one. 
so this requires some very small slices of the data where uh, you just need like really uh, give me like this region of the sky very quickly and maybe a lower resolution then I can actually zoom in for the higher resolution there so uh, this is different kind of access then uh, this one which I, which I need for the machine learning because there I'm actually um, multiple times uh, like for example for every epoch of the machine learning algorithm I need to read the whole data set very quickly and if I'm just doing like small cutouts for example around like, like these cutouts around the spectrum then uh, like uh, doing the random access it would be very inefficient so this is really like dense uh, data set uh, read from the HDF5 which I'm using for the machine learning so uh, this is just a zoom in on uh, that uh, HDA5 box uh, from the previous uh, diagram. So how it looks like in the inside. And so this is what we needed to build within HDA5 actually to support the semi-sparse data there. It's much, much better to use it for dense data. Uh, so uh, for usage with uh, the semi-sparse data, we needed to build essentially like a database index. As you can see, we have two branches here, like the semi-sparse cube here uh, and the dense cube. So within the semi-sparse cube, there is like database index on top of the original data, basically. This is like enriched and uh, yeah, pre-processed uh, uh, data, so it can be used then for the machine learning. But uh, essentially, it's really the original image uh, for the Im one, uh, one image data set here and an original spectrum for one spectral data set. So these are like one-to-one. -one. Uh, we are also preserving like any fits header metadata that they had within uh, uh, this image metadata and spectral metadata here. And then uh, we, we have this database index which enables us to quickly search like spatially, where are they on the sky, temporal index, where are they like in time, spectral index, and then like for different resolutions of those images, like give me the original resolution or give me actually lower resolution for a quick visualization, etc. Then uh, what we are doing on top of this semi-sparse data is said uh, that we are uh, constructing this dense 4D cube, which is nothing else than just a like redundant copy of uh, uh, every spectrum uh, that we need to actually uh, run the machine learning on and their uh, uh, relevant uh, image cutout. So every spectrum, as I showed you, like there is a spectrum of the galaxy, it's overlapping, uh, there are images overlapping the spectrum. So I need to just quickly get all of the image overlaps so then I can actually process them. So then uh, I, I'm just taking all of these and writing them into this dense 4D cube data set, which then the machine learning algorithm is really able to access within this one sequential read, and I can uh, easily parallelize that. So uh, th this is very efficient access for the dense data or dense uh, like copy of, of the data that is relevant for my machine learning algorithm. Still, I'm able to access actually the uh, semi-sparse data here efficiently for the visualization. So that was the whole idea why we actually build this encapsulation for both kind of accesses within HDA5. This is maybe more uh, um, telling for you. This is HDA view. Uh, so this is how it looks like. There is the semi-sparse cube, there is the dense cube, and uh, within the semi-sparse cube, you can see the index actually. It's uh, like this tree structure of the groups. Uh, where th these are all like spatial indexes, like hierarchical index for tessellation of the sphere. Then there is like the time, these are just seconds, like uh, um, the uh, Thai time, I think. This is like wavelength, so it's just nanometers for the midpoint of, of, the, of the filter. And then uh, there are the images like for different pre-computed uh, um, resolutions. So always the leaves of the uh, tree are data sets, uh, either image data sets or spectral data sets. And then there is the dense cube, which has uh, like views on, the, on those data, which is like uh, the cutout 3D cube zoom uh, or spectral 1D cube. So these are like uh, the dense data set that I'm using for the machine learning over there. And so th these uh, can be read out uh, very efficiently. Uh, by the way, this whole thing works because the dense cube uh, is still like only up to 10% of the size of the original data here because I'm doing just small cutouts around the spectra. So uh, it, it uh, still pays off to me uh, to make this redundant copy and uh, it, it's not, not uh, costing me too much additional space there. Now, uh, what I will actually show you the performance of, uh, that's uh, the interesting part, how to get the data into the HDF5 itself. Uh, 
the, the, the read performance that's there. Yeah, that's why we chose it, uh, and we know that it will perform well. But uh, I need to get the data somehow in the, to, into the semi-sparse format within HDF5 in my lifetime. Uh, and we want to scale it this four petabytes of data. Yeah, so um, we, we managed to do that almost for every phase. These are like the phases of the pre-processing, uh, how to uh, get the data into the HDF5. So in there, the phase one is the only one running in sequential uh, mode. Here you can see that the master process is actually pre-allocating the whole HDF5 file. It's uh, like reading the fit headers, creating groups, creating data sets and writing attributes. Anything that would need to be a collective operation, essentially, as we are creating really lots of groups and lots of data sets here. This is done by the master because uh, it was performing much better than uh, if he tried it to, to, to do it in parallel. Then phase two and phase three, it's uh, nothing fancy again, just the master here distributes the workload and then the workers, the purple ones, uh, just uh, preprocess the images or spectra and write them independent, completely independently into their pre-allocated data sets uh, because uh, they don't change the metadata, the file structure, so they can do it uh, in independent writes. So this is completely running in parallel. Phase four is just linking the spectra and images together to create uh, the 4D uh, cube, and phase five is actually making the, that redundant, redundant copy. This one is not trivial how to make it in parallel, but, but uh, it's still doable. Yeah. So uh, the phase one is really like the bottleneck here to actually make the allocation of the HDF5 file. So how did we actually uh, get to um, our result? We were testing it on uh, SDSS data, so it's images and spectra. Basically, um, it's um, nothing too big, it's 15 terabytes and 700 gigabytes respectively. It's not the challenging part, but the challenging part there is it's 1 million FITS files for images and 4 million FITS files for spectra, so really it's a lot of tiny files. So in the end, in the HDF5 file, after it's like pre-allocated after this phase one by, by this master process, it has 100 million groups, like as part of this uh, tree index structure, and then 20 million data sets, uh, because we are like pre-computing lower resolutions for, for the original uh, images and spectra as well, which can be challenging in HDA5. And we'll get to why. So this is uh, uh, for H5Pi. So uh, who is actually for H5Pi here? Uh, so, so who is interested into this slide? Uh, don't worry, I will not <laughs> shout here. So, so you can raise your hand. Basically, this is... Uh, uh, the performance of H5 Pi for just really the phase one, the allocation of that uh, uh, HDF5 file for then uh, the writers to be able to write to. So uh, you can see that uh, it's a super linear function. Uh, it's for this is for 300,000 images, and uh, it's actually uh, for 300,000 images, it's taking like 30,000 seconds. And uh, for the whole 1 million, um, our, our data sets, we were, not, this is like 10 hours. So uh, for the whole data set, it was not able to finish in one week. So then uh, uh, we took a look at it with Gert here, and uh, we actually pinpointed that the, the issue is somewhere here. And uh, we rewrote, you know, basically, we took this architecture where like the his cube is just calling H5Pi, which in turn is through site and calling HDFC library. So we made this, uh, we just uh, made a Python C extension, uh, Python C extension over here, which is calling the C library directly. Uh, YC extension, it was just easier at the time. So then you can see that uh, for the whole 1 million images, yeah, the scales are different here. It's running for 5,000 seconds. Yeah, so instead of like 30,000 seconds for 300K, and uh, the, of course, it's like faster uh, in C, but the important part is that uh, this, if you close on one eye, this is like linear, right? Uh, so so uh, then it's scaling pretty well, whereas this is like super linear, so it will get slower and slower over time. Essentially, this is uh, uh, another view on the same matter, yeah? So in H5Pi, the reason perhaps why it is getting slower is that if I'm unlucky for some images, I need to reallocate some internal structures within H5Pi, or that's what we guessed, yeah? Maybe it would be great to have a discussion why this is happening. And it's getting slower and slower the more data I have in the HDF5 file. Whereas in C, uh, you can see that uh, the rate at which I'm able to uh, create uh, the object within HDF5, like data sets, groups, etc., it's constant. Yeah, so then it doesn't matter whether I'm uh, processing 20 million files or just 10, it, it, it will be still the same rate. The same bandwidth. So for phase two and three, 
Uh, basically, we were just measuring how much through output we are able to get through there. So for chunk data set, it's obviously slower. For contiguous data set, uh, it's faster. Um, the chunk data set needs to do a lot of small writes, that's why. So for uh, uh, 48 processes, 48 writers, we were able to uh, peak at 700 megabytes per second. Uh, this is, by the way, six workers per node. Yeah, we are uh, running this on an eight node cluster, which has a parallel file system beneath that. So uh, in here it's scaling up to 48, so, so six workers per node. In here it's like eight workers per, per node. Then it gets slower and slower. This is not that great. Yeah? Uh, we needed to uh, actually investigate that uh, compared to the original performance or the baseline performance of the file system. The reason for that is that it's also doing a lot of read operations in the meantime. We can get into the detail if you're interested offline, I guess. Um, uh, it, needs, it needed some further investigation. This is also something that we should improve in, in, in the future. This is just to verify that uh, when I'm reading actually the dense data set, the 4D cube out of it, it's performing well. Because you can see that the 16 gigabytes per second compared to like 22 gigabytes is still pretty fine. Uh, so I'm able to, like for the eight nodes, I'm scaling up and uh, there I'm at 76% efficiency uh, for the HDA5 or for the His cube actually, which is on top of H55. And uh, that's still pretty fine for me. Um, if, if I'm actually oversaturating um, or over allocating the workers here, so we can see like, like uh, I have like 60 or 20, uh, 256. Uh, the interesting part is that this is not deteriorating, yeah? uh, that uh, I'm still uh, able to achieve the same read bandwidth, if, even if the processes are competing for the I.O., which is not the case in here, yeah? in, um, in the writing. Yeah? In here, if I'm competing for the I.O., it gets uh, much slower pretty quickly. So, uh, for the summary, yeah? uh, what I uh, want you to take away is uh, that uh, basically, we have proved on this data that we are able to scale uh, the his cube, like the hierarchical semi-sparse cubes within HDA5 to petabytes of data, or rather, not yet, uh, that there are no big obstacles that, it should, that we should get there. The one, and I will talk about the future work here, is uh, the phase one, and we need to somehow get that better. And uh, the thing that surprised us is that we are still able to uh, do this with this like human readable index within the HDA5 file. You see, you saw the whole like tree structure of that index in there, and it's still running pretty fast yeah, even with this amount of uh, groups. So uh, we didn't didn't need to condense that to some kind of data set that would be like representing the index. It still is doable like this. Maybe we will need to change that for petabytes, but for terabytes of data, it's still fine. And uh, for the H55, yeah, I promised like in the teaser that. Uh, uh, to answer the question whether Python is fast enough. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we need to rewrite parts of it into C uh, because uh, just the overhead of Python is causing some uh, superlinearity in the overall runtime. Yeah. So that's what we needed to do. But uh, if you do that in uh, um, C Python, then you can still maintain again the same code base which we are doing. So it's not that, that, of a, uh, that big of a deal actually for us. So for future work, uh, the phase one scalability is a big issue, which I hope that we could discuss here, uh, how we can actually make that better. And for phase two and phase three, also how to improve or get closer to the baseline performance of the writes on the distributed file system. That would be also great. Last but not least, I want to thank Gerrit here because uh, he uh, invested a lot of time into me and investigating all of these issues. I would not be able to get uh, past that issue with, uh, without him. So thank you a lot. And uh, yeah, that's it from me, so um, room for your questions now. Okay, thank you. So me, yeah, I would like to start by myself because mm -hmm. I have a question. So you yeah. mentioned that uh, you have, uh, you are producing HDA5 with that many, so how many HDA5 files? It's one actually, I, I, that was the goal from the beginning to have one an encapsulated file. Uh, we could get by better with like one file per process or something, but uh, we have just one HDA5 file where we, everybody is writing like into this shared one. And why you wanted to have really one file and not more than one file? Was it just for to test or it's uh, for Actually, like in the beginning, uh, we, we were uh, also thinking about the encapsulation itself so we could share it uh, because the interoperability is a big issue with, uh, with astronomy usually. Uh, 
right now we are at the rate that we um, make the file like f four times bigger than the original data, like because of this enrichment and uh, uh, the overhead of the HDA5. But uh, th then uh, the original like thought about the encapsulation might not be that uh, appealing and yeah, to transfer this uh, uh, like four times more than the original data. So maybe we could split it into more files, but uh, uh, that would actually complicate things for the machine learning algorithm afterwards. And yeah, so, so uh, also there are multiple reasons why to keep it in one file, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there any question? Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question. Uh, which part of H5Pi did you rewrote in C to know where was the bottleneck? I guess it's fetching the data, but to be sure. No, no, no. Uh, actually, it's uh, uh, the reading of the FITS files that's uh, done by an, in another C library, uh, which is like uh, bindings into Python. But uh, uh, what uh, we needed to parallelize is uh, that uh, uh, actually creation of uh, groups data sets and writing attributes to them. That was actually slow in H5Pi, or getting slower, rather, when you had a lot of them in the HDF5 file. Okay, so that's actually creating the structure more than the data, that was the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the interesting part about it is uh, that uh, you allocate, uh, we, have, we are allocating 60, 60 terabyte file, uh, and also you are doing the allocations early within the data set, because uh, then you need the writers to be able to do that independently, those writes. Uh, but the size of that file on a disk is just like a, a few uh, gigabytes, like tens of gigabytes. It's like a sparse file before you actually write the data set themselves. So, so in the end, you are writing just uh, tens of gigabytes of data within, within uh, this uh, C booster, let's say. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Okay, any question in the chat? Anything? Um, on, on that latter point, um, I was wondering if you could just use a low-level API for H5Pi, um, because that's basically just Cython, if I understand correctly. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, we tried that, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but that was not enough. Still, still, the slowdown was there, even with the low-level uh, uh, API. So basically, uh, what we were, um, what, what we de did uh, is that uh, uh, we just uh, created another layer that uh, we create the whole structure of the H HDA5 file within Python, like as some kind of, it's really a nested dictionary. And then I pass this nested, nested dictionary to a C uh, function, like a, a C method within this Python C extension. And then it iterates through this Python dictionary uh, and uh, it actually creates all the data sets uh, and groups uh, and attributes with, uh, with the C, uh, within the C library itself. So, so everything there is happening in the C already. I see, so you, you actually implemented a lot of part of this in C itself. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. It would be actually interesting to have a chat of uh, whether we should actually uh, uh, also put this into H5Pi maybe, uh, like into the code base. It's a little bit specific to our use case, yeah, what we are doing, uh, but uh, certainly we could also uh, write, um, uh, put it as a pull request there and uh, also make it available. Right, I, I encountered similar issues, although um, my solution was to jump over to Julia to do some of this work, so. Okay, then we can connect maybe. <laughs> <laughs>